Hey guys, this is Srini and in this video, let's have a look at how an ensemble of deep neural networks can really provide us better accuracy compared to a single deep learning model. By that, what I mean is, let's say you have uh, four different models, right? Model number one could be your VG, uh, VGG pre-trained network. Model number two can be your inception. Model number three can be something you put together and model number four can be something else. And this can be uh, uh, for classification or for semantic segmentation, right? You may have, uh, uh, for example, uh, UNET with uh, VGG as uh, encoder and uh, some uh, something else as decoder. Another unit with something else and something else, right? It doesn't matter. For a given problem, you have uh, a choice of different models that you can use. And oftentimes what we do is we fit this uh, and then uh, in fact, we, you probably try like four or five different models and you're like, wow, this is the best one. So this is giving me 96% of accuracy. So let's go ahead and use it. Uh, maybe, it's a better thing if you can, if you can do the computation, right? I mean, we I'm talking about training four different models separately or in parallel if you can do that. Train four different models, okay? And instead of discarding the ones that you think are not giving you the best results, how about just using the trained models to go ahead and do the predictions and then use those predictions and uh, uh, and and uh, uh, do some tricks to actually get the best out of these four. Okay, that's exactly what we are trying to do here. So in this example, I'm going to show you two approaches. One is okay, you do all the predictions from three models that we are going to look at, and uh, then sum all the outputs from these three and take the one uh, you know that's the best out of these. Uh, uh, you know, take the one that actually wins out. Again, we'll we'll have a quick look uh, once we get to the code. Uh, you can also do a weighted average. Instead of averaging all or instead of summing all with equal weights, how about just saying, okay, my model number one and two, uh, okay, I, I, I want to give less importance, but model number three, a bit more importance. Now, that could be because model three, uh, you know that those features work for your images, right? Again, why are we doing this? Because each model uh, shines at doing one specific job. So maybe VGG is good at uh, recognizing certain uh, certain features in your images. Inception is good at recognizing some other features in your images, right? So each model does something unique. So by combining them, you're actually benefiting from what these are all good at. I hope that makes sense. In this example, I'm gonna use to keep things simple, I'm going to use like three models that we kind of put together and work on the MNIST uh, hand digits, uh, you know, alphabets. Uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, that data set and uh, have a look at how we are going to do this. Again, this is very simple if you already know how to do, you know, Python coding and then getting the predictions and summing the results, but at least hopefully this will uh, work as a refresher for you guys. Okay, three minutes of talking, nothing, that's not good. Let's go ahead and jump into the code and have a uh, quick look, okay? Okay, so uh, here you see where we left off in the last tutorial. In the last tutorial, we basically put together a quick model like right there with one, two, three convolutional layers and uh, a dense layer and then output right here for this specific problem, which is again, alphabets. And uh, let's go back up. Uh, actually, let's we, we, we'll redo uh, part of this anyway. So uh, this is this is where we left off and uh, we got pretty decent, uh, pretty decent accuracy. I think it was uh, for 10 epochs, we were getting 94%. Uh, it's worth looking at it. Uh, we were getting, sorry about this. Uh, where is it? Where is it? I'll scroll uh, one more. Yeah, 93.8%, right? Let's see if we can improve this using uh, Ensemble. Okay, so that's the goal for now. And let's clear everything so we don't confuse ourselves. And let's switch. Again, don't just watch the video, okay? I'm going to share the code. So look at the description under, you know, to find my Git, GitHub uh, link and then just download the code, okay? Don't don't waste your time uh, trying to write down anything right now. Please pay your full attention. Okay, so let's go ahead. And again, the data set is from uh, Kaggle. And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, literally, Oh, sorry, not saved models. This is literally two CSV files and each CSV file, I think I have this open. Um, you can see it has seven pixel number 784 as the last column. And let's go ahead and bring this back. And the first column is label and then everything else is pixel one to pixel 784. So the label goes from zero to 24. Uh, 
that's because uh, there are 26 alphabets and zero to 20 i mean up to 25th you have images and 26th is uh, the letter z and z in sign language you you need to make some motion so they don't have it here okay so here is the uh, uh, and the remaining pixels here they define the image for that specific alphabet okay so with this understanding again let's go ahead and jump in i assume you watched my last video if not go ahead and do that that's why i'll go through the uh, parts we covered in the last video uh, a bit faster okay all the required libraries let's go ahead and run it i'm defining the number of epochs as 10 ahead of time because uh, um, we are going to train three models for 10 epochs each i was initially testing with two epochs and three epochs i have been tested with 10 yet we'll find out you know live while recording the video but anyway uh, let's define that and let's capture our test and train as part of our uh, pandas data frame because pandas makes it easy for us to read csv files and then let's go ahead and convert that into numpy arrays okay so after i'm done with this i should have a numpy array for training and testing and as you can see the first column represents the label 0 through 24 and everything else is our image which means first of all let's define a class uh, uh, the class labels or class names as A through Y because it makes it easy when we plot our images to see oh this is Y this is T otherwise if it's alphabet number 17 I'm not good at finding out what exactly that means okay now let's go ahead and plot some random images again this is the sanity check I do all the time yeah see I recognize the C so that's correct and Q I have no clue what Q is supposed to be and uh, in fact this is making it a bit sorry about this uh, this is making it a bit difficult to interpret. I should have been ready with this, but uh, for plotting, let's actually use a smaller size so it makes it easy for us to identify these. Okay, so O, that's, I know that is O. M, I have no clue what M should look like. G, okay, so we're good. It looks like uh, uh, looks like it's it's uh, matching up, so we are fine. Okay, uh, P and uh, V. Okay, so this is again a sanity check. Now I did this in the last tutorial. If you want to see how the data is distributed, like between all the alphabets, looks like they're all very fairly balanced. Okay, so four is a bit underrepresented compared to seventeen, but. On average, it's not like I have uh, uh, four, like only 200 of something and then 2000 of something else. They're fairly balanced. So I don't want to worry about balancing the data sets yet. Um, all these values go between zero to 255 because they uh, originally are eight bit images. So I'm dividing them by 255. So the uh, it's a way of scaling the data. So going between zero to one, right? Uh, the range goes between zero to one. Okay. And uh, uh, for Y train, again, Y train is part of our training data NumPy array, except it's only the zeroth column, right, in the NumPy array. That's why we have our training data here. And again, we are going to use categorical cross entropy as our loss function. So I'm converting our data into two categorical, which is one hot encoding. Remember, if you don't convert that to one hot encoding, you, the categorical cross entropy, when you try to compile the model, it throws an error. That doesn't mean it's the end of the world. You can still use something called uh, sparse categorical cross entropy, which interprets this data as 0, 1 through 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to 24. But it's good practice to convert it to categorical. Although, one note, why would you not convert it to categorical? Uh, I think computationally, this is faster if you don't do that. If you just use sparse categorical and just use this, it may be uh, computationally uh, faster. But this data set is small anyway, so it doesn't matter. Okay, let's do the same for our test data set, Y test categorical. And now let's reshape our training and testing so they are at the right shape for our neural network, meaning they went from 27,455, 784 to 27,455 by 28 by 28 by one, right? This is our image size and one is the channels and this is how many images we have. Uh, so we're all set actually. Now let's define our three models. Here is where you can import your pre, uh, predefined models. Like you, here is where you can import, okay, from Keras dot whatever uh, I think models you can import your vgg16 you can import your inception with the pre-trained weights if you want and all that stuff okay so this is but here i'm just defining our model as uh, the first one is exactly the same as last you know the one from our last video which is conv three convolutional layers flattened dense layer and dense layer and i'm compiling it using categorical cross entropy and uh, uh and uh, again uh, uh, printing the summary so let's go ahead and do that 
let us run these lines up to here so we should see a summary there you go and the last output would be 25 each a probability of for a given alphabet right now let's go ahead and uh, instead of fitting this now let's let's go through the code a bit and then run the whole thing uh, uh, you know together okay so this is my model number one and I'm going to fit it okay to my training data set and to my X and Y and uh, save the model I'll do exactly the same with the next one next one is I just did two convolution max pooling three convolution max pooling and then con 2d con 2d flatten and so on okay the I don't know if this is better than the other but I just put this together right and save it and model number three is exactly I mean something different yeah and go ahead and uh, save this so let us go ahead and run everything from here okay so we are going to train three of these uh, for each 10 epochs and i'm going to uh, pause this video and continue the real story begins after this i hope you're still um, stay tuned i mean staying tuned so let's go ahead and run this it should be fast okay i'm pausing it right now and i'll continue as soon as this is done okay so finally it's done and all the models seem to have uh, done a great job because this is again not a that much of a difficult uh, task but let's have a quick look uh, here you know uh, to see which model is doing you know uh, a good job now first of all uh, the first one right there right i mean if you look at the training you see the validation accuracy 93 percent we already saw this in the last video and uh, the training accuracy of 97%, right? Okay, this is this is good. Uh, that tells me uh, the similar accuracy. I mean, this one is slightly better. That kind of tells me that, okay, maybe not too much overfitting, but some overfitting, right? Typically, uh, I'd like to see same um, accuracy between these two. Now, going to the next one. Here we have dropout layers, okay? Going to the next model. This is the model number two. Now you can see, uh, uh, where, where are we, where are we? sorry let's go back let's go back one more step okay sorry this is the second model and the second model you can see that the accuracy for our uh, training reached 100 percent so we're getting 100 percent accuracy on the training data but then the validation accuracy is 88 percent much lower that tells me this model is too complicated and it is too it's overfitting which we know, right? I mean, our model number two has no dropout layers and many convolutional layers and many parameters trained. Uh, so, so no wonder it's actually doing a great job on the training data, but not on the uh, on the testing data, on the validation data. Again, I apologize if you think I'm talking basics to you guys, but you never know <laughs> what information you probably don't know. And the next one is the most simplest one, right? I mean, I don't have many convolution, convolution, max pool and dropout. This is my favorite type of uh, uh, networks because they usually work very well. Uh, so let's go down and see what's going on here. And again, it's doing 99% on uh, the training data set, 93% on the testing. So a quick, quick idea. Now we are done with this and let's go and see what we get when we combine all of these results together, right? So we save these into like specific model names. So let's go ahead and load them again and assign them to uh, just a quick, yeah, let's go ahead and load them. I just want to make sure I'm using the latest ones. Just a second while it's loading the model. So, uh, okay, so it's uh, loading the right one. Sanity check. And now I'm adding all of these into a list called models because obviously I would like to iterate through each of these, right? So I'm ad uh, adding these as models. And now my predictions, I'm going to predict uh, on the, my test data for each of these models, okay? So uh, here is basically uh, model.predict for model in model. So it's basically going to give me a predicts list uh, uh, with all the predictions, okay? So we'll see that uh, here in a second. Uh, there you go, a list of three where we have like three NumPy arrays containing all the predictions. Now let's com convert that list into a NumPy array. And now, uh, why did we do that? So I can actually add all of these predictions together, okay? So now I'm actually do, using np.sum to add all the predictions. So if you look at the predictions, I have three. 
uh, by 7172 by 25, right? These three corresponds to the results that we get from the three models that we just trained. Okay, if you have five models, that'd be five. Now, in the axis of zero, meaning along this three axis, right, I'm just adding the numbers, which means I should end up with 7172 by 25. Let's run this and look at our summed 71, 72 by 25 here. This is basically sum of each of these. So uh, at, at uh, pixel, uh, you know, uh, uh, at, at value number one, for example, in model one, model two and model three, adding all, right? So if the uh, probability is 0.1 in the first one, 0.3 and 0.2, we are adding all of these, okay? Now let's go ahead and use argmax, okay? from this summed axis, which means we have 25 columns, each corresponding to a specific alphabet, right? A, B, C, D, E, F. For A, we have these three model predictions and we added them. So on using model one, if the prediction is 0 0.1, using model two, if the prediction is 0 0.2, model 3.3, .3, when you add them, you get 0 0.6, sum of all of these. So they all don't add to one, they add to three, if it is a good, you know, uh, uh, I mean, basically they all add to, if you add all of these, they add to three. Anyway, argmax is basically looking at, okay, now that you summed all for A, you do the same for B, same for uh, C and so on. So for each alphabet, you do that. And now we are picking, what is the max uh, 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 probability or three times the probability in this, in this row? That's exactly what I'm doing. So this is basically, hey, uh, three models just show me the uh, give me the maximum uh, uh, you know position of this maximum so in a way we are converting these probabilities into a prediction now if you look at ensemble prediction now you see uh, in the first one right there the first image it's saying the prediction is six apparently when you add all of these six is the maximum so this is one way of dealing with your ensemble now here uh, by doing this, we are actually giving equal weight to all the models, right? I'm saying model one, model two, and model three are equally important. If you want to add weights, you just multiply each model with a specific number to add that weight, which I'll show you in a second. But I hope this makes sense, okay? This, this can, again, like I said, it can be any number of models. It can be any type of models. You're just doing the prediction and doing math with your predictions. Okay, now let's go ahead and uh, uh, predict for one, two, and three models, okay? And print out the accuracies. Just to see, okay, what is the, I'm also curious about the ensemble accuracy because our actual accuracies are already not bad, you know, from each of these. And now let's go ahead and print out the accuracies for each of these and the ensemble. Okay, there you go. So for model one, 93.5%, model two, 88.5, we saw that, a bit of overfitting going on, model three, 93.2. But when you combine this, when you ensemble this, we are getting a probability of 95.1, which is obviously better than any one of these. That's why combining these gives you much better strength than uh, these. Again, I may be showing a simple case scenario, but believe me, this thing works amazingly well, especially if you have biological image segmentation where you have like too many uh, uh, features that are, uh, are tough to segment or even remote sensing images, right? Satellite images. Some areas are tough to segment and you may find that, oh, this model is doing very good for houses or this model is doing very good for mitochondria, but this other model is doing very good for lipids or something else. Okay, then use all three, four, five models. I know it takes time for training, but once you train it, you, you know, then you can use all of those for predictions and then just combine the prediction. This is exactly the strength of ensemble and I hope you get the point, right? This is the take home message. Now let's actually, uh, uh, let's, let's see uh, weighted average. Can we actually get this better than 95.1%? Meaning, if I say, okay, my model one is like eh, only 0.2, you know, take weight it by 20%. I like my model two weighted by 50% and I like model three to be 30%. So you can add these different weights. So that's exactly the next one, right? Weighted average ensemble. What, what, uh, how do you do that? Well, you probably know if you are good with uh, uh, Python, all we are doing is again, I'm repeating exactly what I've done there except I'm adding weights here. Uh, let's say model one is 0 0.4, model two is 0 0.2, model three is 0 0.4, right? These are the weights. Then I'm going to use uh, numpy.tensor. Uh, I hope you have used this in the past. If you're not, what it does is it actually uh, 
uh, sums the product of all elements. So basically it multiplies, predicts, and weights, and then it sums that, right? That's exactly what we want. Instead of just np.sum that we have done here, np.sum, we are actually doing the multiplication of these two and then sum, right? So that's what this tensor dot is. So let's run these lines one more time up to this point, okay? So now we have, and the remaining is the same. The remaining is the same. All we do is again, once you sum all of these, the weighted sum, you just need uh, to find out the arg max, what is the maximum you know, uh, class in this case. And then uh, let's go ahead and calculate the accuracy and print out the accuracy scores for everything that we have done until now. And there you go. Now you can see that with the weighted average ensemble, our accuracy went up by albeit a little bit, but it did go up from 95.1% to 95.5%, okay? And uh, these little things really help uh, when, you, uh, when you're doing these ensemble, especially for uh, difficult to segment or difficult to classify uh, 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 challenges, right? Now, uh, is this the right combination? 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and 0 0.4? We don't know. You can play with 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.2. So this is where grid search can actually help. I mean, uh, uh, you can automate this many ways. What I've done is basically pretty much the same first two lines, right? And then I am going to capture all of the data into a uh, pandas data frame. So I'm just changing the uh, weights from zero to five. In fact, I'm dividing them by 10, meaning zero to 0.5. So weight one is going from zero to 0.5. So instead of 0 0.4, 0 to 0.5, 0 to 0.5, 0 to 0.5, right? Uh, between those, we should get all combinations adding up to one. Uh, and I put them into three nested uh, for loops and uh, exactly the same code in the for loop. And eventually I'm going to print out, okay, what is the maximum accuracy? Uh, and what, uh, where did we get that for what weights and everything? Okay, so let's uh, run this code. Okay, now at the end of this, we should have a data frame that actually contains, uh, that actually contains uh, our uh, weights and the accuracies, that's it, right, at the end of this. So if you look at DF, uh, hopefully I can open this, yeah. There you can see, this is the accuracy. Again, I'm multiplying by 100, so we can see this as a percentage. And these are the weights, corresponding weights. So for all of these, these are the accuracies. Now I can go through this, but there is a uh, IDX max, right? I mean, we can print out where the maximum value in accuracy showed up, okay? So let's go ahead and print that. And uh, let's put that into a nice print command right there. So I got a maximum accuracy of 96.5%. Remember previously we got a maximum accuracy of 95.5. So we went from 93.5, 88.5, 93.2 to 95.1 using ensemble. Then we are playing with weights to actually bring it up to 96.5. That's significant improvement in accuracy as you can tell. Okay. And this happened at a weight of 0 0.4, 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. Okay. With these weight. Uh, so let's go ahead and say 0 0.4, 0 0.1, and 0 0.2, okay? These are my weights. With this weight, let's go ahead and look at, uh, 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 look at, our, uh, look at our model. So with that, I'm going to calculate my uh, weighted accuracy. Again, this is just a repetition of code we have done here and the same repetition of the code we have done here, right? I'm just now finally looking at, okay, with, uh, with these weights, how does life look like, okay, for me? Uh, and now let's go ahead and predict some of these images. Uh, so let's look at these. That is uh, true label is H, predicted label is H. We could have added uh, to resize the images, that's Y. This one is S. We should, get, we should get pretty good accuracy right now, right? I'm curious about where we are going wrong. So let's go ahead and print out our confusion matrix, okay, and have a quick look at the confusion matrix. And this can be a bit busy, but this uh, these values seem to be not bad, actually. Uh, again, visually, this can be a very bit, uh, a bit of, uh, you know, difficult to interpret. So let's go ahead and plot uh, the percentage of inaccuracies, right? So here uh, looks like we have about 15% of our, uh, uh, you know, 15% misclassifications for I. And uh, for S, we have about 12%, and uh, not bad, actually. If you look at my previous video, the highest was like 30% or something. So everything 
came down a bit for whatever reason i s u seem to be misclassified more than anything else down here okay so uh, i hope you learned the power of ensembles and this is not very tricky even with your uh, let's say uh, basic python skills with some uh, keras knowledge if you can put together a bunch of models whether by importing pre-trained models uh, and then training them again or uh, you know it doesn't matter it's up to you you have five different models ten different models you train them independently and then take the output and then create an ensemble always always ensemble beats the individual models Hopefully you'll find that out on your own data sets. Thank you very much. I know you loved this video, so please hit the like button. And also please do subscribe to this channel. Thank you very much.